What is up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm here with UFC fighter Richie Walsh, uh, Filthy Rich. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> What's going on, brother? Not too much, mate. Just uh, cruising, getting ready for the next fight. Yep. Um, looks like it's going to be in November. Mm. So, yeah, just back to the drawing boards, uh, trying to do some technique, you know, coming off uh, the last fight in Brisbane and uh, just getting the hands strong again. Um, yep. you know, broke that one in the last fight. So, yeah, just really getting back into it, doing about two to three sessions a day and, and trying to enjoy myself as well. And your last fight was in Brisbane against... Who was your last fight against? Uh, it was against a Brazilian... Uh, his name's Viscard Ad, Adraj. Yep. Adraj. And uh, a Brazilian fella, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Um, funny enough, I lost the decision to him. I broke my hand at the start of round two. Ooh. And, um, you know, like, I mean, people say, oh, did you notice that? And there's a moment where I've hit him in the fight with an overhand right, yep. and I can I'll probably get you the footage. And, and you can just see that that's the one that broke my hand, you know, right right on my thumb, and I've broken it a few places. So I have to get a titanium plate uh, put in there, you know, straight after the fight. <laughs> but I uh, lost the decision. Um, you know, his results came back a couple of weeks afterwards, and he'd actually tested positive to, to drugs. So I'm in a bit Fucking of, a, I'm in a, bit of a, a situation now where we're trying to appeal the fight and yep. uh, make it a no contest because they can't give a win in the UFC. It's either, you know, if the person's caught for juicing or whatever it is by USADA, it's just a no contest. Mm. You know, I don't get any sort of um, reparations for that in any, you know, I don't even get, you know, the satisfaction of it being a splurged win. on the media like all these, you know, Olympians and these other guys, like they're all juicers. Yeah. Um, you know, I just get a no contest marked on it and everyone remembers, you know, at the end of the day, I lost the decision. Um, Fucking hell. And come away with half the money. That's ridiculous. So, and you don't get any financial reparations? Not really. So, so what, what's... No, no, not at all. I don't get any financial reparations. So the UFC works in a bit of a, you know, if you, you, you get a certain amount of money to, to rock up and a yep. certain amount of money to win. Um, you know, thank God they pay for my hand when I broke it. Um, and then afterwards, USADA have came in about a year ago. So you've seen a few people get popped for, for juicing, which is, which is good. It's cleaning up the sport. Um, but I think these guys are got to pay a little bit, you know, more of a hefty price. You know, his, yeah. his drug test twelve days before the fight came back uh, with Stanozol, so a testosterone, and then his B sample came back with Stanozol, um, allegedly. Okay, this is what I've heard through yep. my um, contact with Yasada. But it's under um, it's under investigation because they had a bit of trouble with the labs in Rio before the oh. Olympics, and, oh, they, and, wow, they, yeah, and yeah. they've shut they shut down the labs, and now they're back open, and Yasada and and other people are happy with the you know the A and B sample of my opponent being being positive to steroids, um, but you know he's going to fight that case. So you know uh, the charges are up. I, in, in my eyes, you know he's a cheater. Mm. Did I did I lose the fight because he's a cheater? I don't I don't necessarily think that's the case. Um, but it doesn't make it uneven playing fields. Yeah, probably does. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I know you know being a UFC fighter and an MMA fighter, mm. you in a lot of non-athletes wouldn't notice this but you tend to make less excuses so you sit across from me and you say oh you know steroids wasn't the reason why i lost it and you're a professional athlete and that's your yeah. mindset yeah. but i mean technically a testosterone in your body improves everything like everything yeah i agree but i, I still look at the fight and i'm like ah there's moments there yeah, where, yeah. where i could have like you know i could dropped him i dropped him to the ground and i jumped into stupid positions that were mm. that were my fault you know and and just to have that um, ability to be aware under under that kind of duress and that pressure and to make the right decisions, that's that's a better athlete, you know. Mm. And, and I don't need steroids to do that. I need my brain. So, yeah. you know, I made a few little um, mistakes when I could have capitalized that I think lost me the fight. And I didn't take any damage during the fight. I think it was more of a positional thing mm. and takedowns that cost me the fight. And you know, I take that on board myself. You know, uh, yep. drugs or not, yeah, the guys, the guys, are dirty cheat. You know, but, but was I fitter than him? Yes. You yep. know, was I more accurate with my strikes? Yes. So, you know, it, it is unfair. Um, but you know, I could have fought better as well. Mm. But you've also got the other side of the, the coin. Uh, it's dangerous. Yep. It is dangerous to go in there with a juiced up a guy on steroids. You know, what if what if he connects you with a a, hit, a punch that is two percent harder? Mm then what he could have hit you with and that punch does some real real damage because it's yeah. not like we're talking about soccer here where he scored two more goals mm. he is your health when you step into that ring is always the end result you know is death yeah i, I totally agree and and with uh, a sport like miss martial arts for you know for people that are listening that don't really understand it's a really cerebral sport you've got to use your brain you've mm. got to think you've got to be active you've got to you know everything is 100 percent focus it's just you and that other person in there it's a real kind of uh, primitive feeling you know so <clears throat> if you can take steroids and you can train harder and you can do more reps 
mm. and become more technical, well, then you can improve and be, be a better fighter on the night. Not necessarily just fitter or stronger, yep. punch harder, but you're also getting technically better. So it is mm. a disadvantage for people like myself uh, you know, to be fighting guys who are juiced up. And, and not only uh, a disadvantage in that respect and technically, but like you said, in safety. Yep. We have people here who are stronger than they should be and faster than they should be. Does it make it for a more entertaining fight? Arguably, I don't know. Yes or no? Um, but it's certainly more dangerous and it's, it is unfair. Oh, mate. I mean, and it's either going to be one way or the other, you know? With yeah. sports, they talk about Olympics and this stuff. It's either going to be everybody juices or no one does. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I don't. I See, the, the, with the whole steroid uh, debate, you know, I can understand the other side of the coin of saying, you know, it's better for the athletes when it comes to recovery yep. and all that kind of stuff. But then it becomes like racing, driving, and your, your team of scientists is all that really matters in this. I mean, obviously, your natural ability does come into play sure. and training hard. But I think, you know, if we went, if we went down the route of like everyone juices, mm. it just becomes like racing and your team of scientists and also who has the most money and who has the most funds to get the, the best science into their body and they become essentially a race car yep. that is getting driven by this team and you lose that natural, not natural selection, but natural difference that is there because everyone's just juiced to the gills. Mm. Uh, everyone has the same, te- you know, for example, um, who is it? Obviously, Vitor Belfort got done with yep. the, the juice but his testosterone levels naturally are extremely high and that's just something that he has mm-hmm. um, whereas Weidman's natural like testosterone are pretty low, are pretty low and these are things that like if you had juicing that then there's no difference and you're all just these robots that are getting juiced you know what I mean yeah. so yeah it doesn't yeah. allow it to be natural you know mm. And look, there's always going to be that, that problem that you have, I think, with especially people from my sport. You have to do so much volume of training and so many sessions, wrestling and boxing and kickboxing and whatever it is. You know, you're driving from place to place, going here and there. You've got to eat. You've got to stay fresh. That There's a chance that, you know, like you just said, with Weidman, you're going to have low testosterone because you're constantly on the mats grinding out wrestling yep. sessions. And you've just got to get them done. It's not like I can rock up to one team training session and we get our skill work in and we get our tackling and this and that it's i've got to go to individual coaches and do a lot of time to to adjust my skills standing and the clinch on the ground so you know you can never be a, a jack of all trades but you're trying to get there yeah you know? so it is increasingly hard i think on your body and and especially on your mind but it's just one of those things mm, that's why it's such that's why it's the fastest growing sport in the world because <laughs> yeah, it's so entertain, entertaining <coughs> and it's exciting yeah, exciting and entertaining i um yeah i, I absolutely love it man i, I love the it's such a perfect mix of what you said, cerebral, but mm. also primal yeah. men and women now. You yeah, know, That's another thing. I, <laughs> I, I know this is going to sound crazy, but MMA for women in society, I think, has been one of the fucking hugest benefits to mm-hmm. women and men in society for us to see and go, these chicks are banging just as hard and just as good. Well, you're not just as good but you know what I mean within context of things yeah sure um, and you know Ronda Rousey the amount of women that got inspiration from all that but yeah so no I, lo- I, I, I love MMA yeah, I, I, there's a I, reason I think, why and for me if, it, if it's good for the sport and um, it's good, good for society and it's, and it's perception on the sport it's, it's good for me ultimately I love the sport I love martial arts I love fighting mm. and I think like you just said fighting is just such a primitive thing that is in our DNA you know yeah you're either you're you're born to be something you know and Mm. i can just feel inside me that i want to be a fighter like when i'm in that ring maybe let's just say not fighter maybe a competitor yeah when i'm in that ring yeah i'm I'm nervous i'm shitting myself before i get in there and i get in there door shuts i'm like whoa we're ready to go you get the adrenaline yeah yep you can't match that feeling you can't match it in training you can't match it anywhere else yep right and you get in there and the, the moment for me is in between round one and two when when the adrenaline's come down and you're just looking at your opponent and he's, he's sucking in the big ones and you're like, yep. that's when you know you're alive yep. in that moment. Yep. And I, for me, I, I believe I was born to be a fighter. Yep. Not to say that I think I'm the best in the world, but I just know that that's what I want to do mm. and that's what makes me feel alive. Yep. You know? And people have got to find what that is for them and some people may never find that. Yep. And I think that's a, that is directly related to how people live these days i don't think we live in a natural surroundings and we don't do yep. things that we're supposed to do in our dna so mm. people have depression and and other problems that i think they wouldn't have you know yeah had it been in a different different time and place yeah so definitely. for me I fa- i'm lucky enough to find what i what i believe that i love doing and what i'm supposed to do you know it's inside me yeah that's you know? uh, a lot of people have told me this isn't for you get your job <laughs> use your degree but i'm like and I'm a fighter. Uh, yeah, I, I love just it. know that when I'm in there, that 
yeah that's what makes me happy 100 percent. and i and you get as you said you get that purpose as well from it yeah that purpose is so important you can wake up and be going to a job that's paying you a million a year but if it's a job where you're doing a monotonous whatever it is and yeah. just same old same old and you don't feel like you have a purpose you're not going to enjoy it you're not going to have whereas you can have you know like guys like yourself that could mm. go use your degree and yet you're choosing mm. to fight another man in a cage for sure because of the purpose and how, how yeah, it good and feels. It's, it's definitely fulfilling mate to be you know 27 years old and you know to actually really be happy with what you've achieved like if it was to end right now and i had to it was taken away from me i'd still you know in here in my heart know that i've really I've, I've achieved something that at times i you know i thought i couldn't do and you know i wanted to quit but i knew that i loved it so yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's a sense of um, fulfillement, you know, which mm. is which is yeah, a great feeling for me. And it's, I guess at the end of the day, as long as if you get that fulfillment, it's mm. all you really need, really. Yeah, it's, like for me, it's never been about being the, the champion and and having people love me and and blow smoke up my ass. For me, it was just about proving a point to myself. You yeah, know? Uh, that this kid who you know wasn't so confident in himself in some respects has you know came out on the other side and done something that maybe you know i did or didn't know that i could i could do yeah you know? and, and it's been hard at times but uh yeah you know like i said you know i wouldn't i wouldn't change it for the world man yeah i, I love watching it man i absolutely i yeah. think it's the ultimate form of of competition yeah MMA well fighter. you know right then and there when you when you get a big punch in the face you know <laughs> am i am i a fighter or am i not <laughs> yeah, yeah and there's nothing wrong with not being a fighter it's just yeah. like it's when the cage locks you see some people when they jump in the cage they get up the steps it's their first fight I was just talking to, to Brendan O'Reilly about this uh, yeah. another UFC fighter yesterday and he said you know I was cornering someone and they, they walked up the stairs and the cage shut and they boom the, and the bolt dropped you know on the cage to yep. lock it yep. and they and their face they looked at the, the oh, bolt no. and they, that was like their realisation <laughs> yeah. like the colour had gone out of their face that like this is, this is real yep. this is real but, you know some people relish that kind of moment and, and live in it and some people yeah, fucking shit their pants. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, yeah, I love him, mate. So yourself, yeah. where are you from? Where'd you grow up in yeah, Australia, uh, mate? I grew up in in Sydney. I grew up my um, I'll tell you a little bit about my family. My parents are uh, immigrants from Ireland. And, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so they landed in uh, Sydney, and we we did most of our growing up on the northern beaches. Mm. Um, yeah, not so, a bad not a bad place to yeah, not not a bad place to grow up, you know. And we had yeah, you know, we had a good upbringing. Um, you know, we're all very close and you know we grew up on a bit of land so mm. enjoyed you know riding motorbikes growing up and down near the beach and all that so you know I, I had it pretty sweet and I think a lot of people in Australia do oh, and they've got to appreciate it you know when you when you travel overseas and you go other places and you just know how lucky you are to be from this country yep. because you know we're very privileged but everything yeah I, I was super privileged just to grow up in Sydney you know yep. and call myself an Australian so and that's still something that makes me very proud is is to you know, I don't know. I, I don't know about you, but I drive through Sydney and I look down at the beaches and some parts of it, and I just go, "Man, this is this is heaven on earth." Hundred percent. And not to say that I'm I'm arrogant about my country, like you know, in saying this is the best country in the world. Like, but for me, it's the best country in the world. Oh, and I, and I'm super proud of when I watch the Olympians on sport or anything like that. I'm like, man, I love that. Yep. And um, yeah, so I, I grew up in Sydney and yeah, very proud of it. Very proud of this country and. Um, and what it's uh, the opportunities I've got from it. And same with my parents. You know, they, you know, my dad came over from from Ireland. Said my mum. So they and, would have uh, grown up in the time when the uh, the issues between the Christians and Protestants. Uh, yeah. Well, my parents are from the south of Ireland, like the Republic. So they're, they're Catholics, and, and there wasn't so much uh, drama there. That was more it's in north. The, yeah, more in the in the north, where uh, you know Northern Ireland is part of Great Britain, mm. and it's only four counties of the twenty six total counties uh, are part of Northern Ireland. So mm. they had the drama up there in the north. So they weren't really part of that, but it was, it was um, bad. Like yeah, when, or bad. Like people, people getting, don't realize how bad getting, it was. You know, their kneecaps shot out and killed yep. and blown up. You know, you walk down the street and um, if you were, you know, you went for a Protestant football club like soccer club, mm. you could have your kneecaps shot out. You know, it was it's there's crazy. Union Jacks in one town hanging up, and then yep. there's the Irish tricolor in the other town. One town's Catholic, one town's Protestant. <laughs> And they're the same religion. They're Christian. Yeah. Oh, it's mate, just crazy. Don't even get me started on that. Yeah, stuff. Let's, yeah let's, let's not even go there to that controversial kind of religion. But I just, um, it's just, it's crazy. Like you know, in Western society, and I am a big fan of Western culture, but we often distance ourselves from from those issues and say, you know, Western sure. society is about freedom and all that stuff. But you've only got to look to Ireland and be like, we were there only not not long ago. Yeah, we just and as dramatic and just mm. as as dangerous and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I mean, I grew up in um, like we we're just talking about in, in, in Sydney and, and uh, 
you know, dad had came out here and he'd started up a butcher shop when he was very young in, in mm. Manly kind of area. Yep. And um, yeah, just a real hard worker and, and successful guy now. So I kind of learned a lot from him as far as hard work. Not necessarily in, in the nine to five <laughs> yeah, spectrum mate. of work, but uh, you know, I kind of transferred into something. And, yep. and for me, that's fighting. So that, that generation Mate, is, is ridiculous. Wall. So like for, uh, my dad's exactly the same. Yeah. He used to wake up at four every morning and have a cold shower, <laughs> a cold shower, and I'm like, he enjoys it. <laughs> yeah, just that's just the way it is. That's yeah. the way it's got to be. Yeah. Oh, I have a cold shower. I think it's a. I think it was a. Now I look back on it as a, a man. When I was a kid, I was like, what the hell? But it was what, just something. Where's your your background? Where's your old man from? Um, he's he's from uh, Brisbane, I think originally. But we lived yep. on the Gold Coast, and he yep. um, helps. Um, Children with special needs and stuff like that, and worked in uh, Catholic education actually. So yeah, yeah. something he, religion does do good. Is a <laughs> he's a good man. He's a good yeah, man. yeah. Um, but he wasn't the religious type. But yeah, sure. he, um, but yeah, he just liked helping people. So he was uh, the head of special education in Queensland. Sure. Um, but yeah, he'd wake up every morning at four, have the cold shower, go do uh, weights, and this was before the whole gym yeah, yeah, culture craze. Yeah. Exactly, because like that's what people don't realize these days. Ten years ago, if you went to the gym, you were a crazy person yeah, that yeah. like. Gym you're, junkie. You're a bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whereas now it's everyone. Yeah. And so this is he down in the shitty garage just doing weights and then he mm. would drive an hour and a half to work and then he'd work all day, like what, 12 hours and yeah. he'd get home at like eight at night and he'd do it constantly. In He told me the other day, in 40 years, in 40 years he's had three days off, three sick days. <laughs> Mate, yeah, that, that was, I think I'm my old man. When I grew up, you know, from the early age to... 18 right yep. my old man I don't think he'd really taken a holiday once at 10, 10 years or 11 years went by and he didn't even take a day off basically mate. like maybe a Sunday but he was just like working hard and, and they don't even it, it's not even brought on the table to complain about it so it's not even like they talk about it and don't complain about it they don't even mention that it's happening I just don't even think people of that generation really talk much about about how they feel yep. to start with just it. and just um, it. yeah I think you become like institutionalize in your own ways you know like yep. for him you know being at his shop the whole time and working and running a small business it becomes like that's your life yeah you know? that's, and, this you, is and you enjoy here. he probably enjoys it and, mm. and hates it at the same time but you know it's the same as everything yeah and it's like it's, it's all he's known so for, for 30 years 20, yeah whatever whereas like you know you got the internet now i think he's fucking with people's heads a lot because Sadly. they see all of these possibilities that aren't actually the reality yeah. And so they think, I can have that, and I can have that, but I'm working this shitty job, so it yeah. hurts them a lot. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I do it myself. You know, yeah, you, you, start, you start scrolling on people's Instagrams and, and all this kind of stuff, and you're in some fantasy world oh, where mate. you're like, holy shit, do chicks look like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or, or do people, you know, like, is that is that reality? And I, I think there's a lot of people who are, are famous for the wrong reasons and promoting the wrong yeah. things. Yeah, um, but at the end of it, you know, you just got to find something that, that works for you. That you know, and if it's a, an honest job, I do believe, and that puts money on the table and can put a family through, um, you know, whatever it is, education, put food on the table. Man, you're successful anyway. Yeah, definitely. Anything on top is just. Brainless. You know, it's another thing in Australia is like anyone that says that you don't have the opportunity to do that are kidding themselves. Like, mm. you can go and work at McDonald's mm. and earn fifty thousand dollars a year. And that is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like that's just the base. That's mm. like that's uh, you know a guy that's a full time employee mm. that's earning eight hundred dollars a week or whatever. Work fifty hours or forty five hours or whatever. Mm. To get that overseas, even in America, yeah. you would have to work your ass off. It's just, it's just like unheard of. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously the living standards here are pretty high, and yeah, and like you said, I've taken a good look around the world, and there's not too many countries that I think are like this to oh, live. Mate. And um, yeah. We truly do have a good. I'm about to start singing the bloody anthem. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, okay, so yeah, so we were always a sportsman growing up, or did you slowly, you know, because MMA it's yeah. it started like on the internet. It, sure. You know, no no networks wanted to play it. It was only forums and getting v DVDs and you know the UFC wasn't always around. You mm. know, it was uh, mm. you had K1 and stuff like that that was originally yeah. less kind of. Oh, like on on that. No, you were just talking about the UFC wasn't always around. Like I, I was introduced to the UFC early two thousands or something, and no one was watching the UFC oh, early two thousands. No. That's when I went through that weird phase of, it's a blood sport, it's violent. You know, mm. and it was, it, the the first UFCs, guys were just ball shotting each other, and there was, it was like there was, guy with a glove and there shit. Was one on. guy, with, like, Art Jemison had one glove. You know, he's like number ten ranked boxer in the Sume world. wrestles versus and shit. the judo guy, and and just to just to add on what we're talking about, like what you saw is I think 
fighting died for for a period of time. Mm. You know, think back to the movie Gladiator. Yeah, you're looking at from before BC to 600 AD. The, the Colosseum was open. This seats 80,000 people. There's people in the middle fighting. There's you know there's gladiators in there who are heroes in the streets of Rome. Yeah. And there's, there's various stadiums all over the empire from France to Germany to Tunisia, Africa. This is fighting at its most raw form. People mm. getting their heads cut off and stabbed. Like, this is a little bit too far. But this, is, <laughs> yeah. this, is, you know, this is what they liked back then. This is crazy. And I, I can imagine from when they shut down the Colosseum and it was, you know, they had the pagan crusades when the Roman Empire was over, they just shut everything down. You know, 600 AD, it was just shut down. Mm. And I think a lot of fighting from that time from you know, a few thousand years ago was just lost hand to hand combat was just lost all mm. these these tools and trades that people knew of fighting was lost mm. and maybe it wasn't put in the right format you know to sustain it it was a bit violent and gory yeah. and whatever else I guess you had a lot of wars too that are getting rid of that energy for yeah, young men yeah that's right there was a lot of there's a lot of other things going on at the time you know but I think a lot of that skill had been lost mm. till um, you know Japanese martial arts and judo say, yeah, and, the and all these things. The spread of these turned into what they had in Port, you know, in uh, Brazil. Vale Tudo was anything goes fighting. Yep. This was around, you know, yep. little fighting, little pockets of uh, no rules fighting was around, and there's always dojo challenges. And you know, you saw the Gracies in action, which is the Gracie Jiu Jitsu guys or the yep. original Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys used to invite people in their gym and fight each other, and they they'd give them fifty grand if they could, you know, if they could beat them, which they never did. Mm. And and you saw in 1993 the UFC come about. They had the first UFC in Colorado Springs or whatever it was. And like we just mentioned before, there's a guy with a karate belt on with his sleeves cut off and a mullet versus versus a guy with one boxing glove. This one was this, yeah, this this was just crazy. So <laughs> it, this kind of spiked the interest again. Yeah, yeah. I think since 20 years ago, since that happened, who's the you, best fighter? Yeah, 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 you've seen more progression in hand to hand or martial arts or mixed martial arts than you have seen in the previous 2,000 years. That's very true, yeah. Okay? So this is something, this is something that's it's, it brought it, you know, with television and internet and media, it, it snowballed. Yep. You know, people love fighting. They love watching fighting. Yep. And if it's in a controlled environment with rules and sanctions and governing bodies and drug and tests, content. hey, yep. this is a great thing. It's yep. in our DNA. It's a natural thing. Let's make it positive. Mm, definitely. I don't, I don't condone kids to go bash each other and, and people to stomp on people's head. That's yep. not fighting. That's just gang stuff or bullying, you know? Yeah. But fighting, you know, having a fight, that's that's natural. And I think you'll find that most kids that go and train in MMA gyms and boxing gyms actually get in less fights, A, because oh, yeah. they're more secure in themselves, they have discipline, mm. they're taught also the uh, consequences of violence. But they also that, that security in themselves ma- gives them strength to walk away from situations like that because they don't need to bash someone to make sure. them feel better about sure. themselves. Yeah, so. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned in um, in learning the limits of your body and just martial arts. Like for, for any you know people listening out there who want to try it or whatever, try it. See Mate, if it's for you. It. I mean, and, and especially for kids, yep. it's a different outlet for learning and learning how to channel their anger and how to channel their emotions. And because you feel all sorts of emotions when you're training and you put your body under that duress and yep. and, 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 and you know. And personally, for me, when I started uh, you know martial arts as a teenager to to now, there hasn't been a need to to really lose it and get in fights. You know, and I'm not going to say in the past that I hadn't been in fights. Mm. You know, we're all human. Most young things happen outside. You're yep. young. You got hormones. Whatever yep. else. You know, I'm not going to make excuses. I've been in fights, and since training and taking it seriously and professionally, I've never needed to to dig for that. You know, I've, yep. I've never felt the need, and I and I do think that is a lesson that is learned with martial Do you feel arts. that once you got this is something I don't know, I don't like. You know, I. I'm just a dude that does a bit of boxing sometimes sure. just for enjoyment. But when I started doing a bit of boxing, I felt less issues arose for some reason. And I, it's yeah. I, less people had issues when I was out. I had less, I don't know what it was. It was just this weird yeah. sensation of like, and maybe it's because of something I used to give off of it, an, insecure, an aggressive insecurity or whatever, mm. even though I'm not an aggressive guy. But do you know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, well, I mean, this, this is something thing. I hear off, like, not just you. I yeah. hear this off. Most people who train, you know, they box or this, and they they get a little bit of competency in how to handle themselves, and suddenly, you know, they don't have that insecurity of needing to act tough. You know, yeah, because yeah. Because you don't need to know you're tough. You know, you know how to throw a punch. It's a subconscious thing. It's, it's weird, thing. isn't yeah, it? It's yeah. kind of like it's 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 kind of counterintuitive. You mm. know, you learn how to fight and box or wrestle, and suddenly you're getting in less fights. Yeah, 
I it's weird, know. and it must. And then you start reflecting, like, yep. I must have been giving off this subconscious vibe of mm. either aggression or passive aggression or something. Yeah, like that. something. And then, but anyway, yeah, so it's, get uh, your kids in martial arts. Hundred percent tomorrow. Definitely I'm opening a gym tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and just the discipline side as well. I think a lot of kids are like, like another thing as well, with so many things, but um, so a lot of young men as well, and you know, even women don't realize that so they've never been in a, a physical context with someone so sure. they say all these fucking stupid stuff and they, they might <laughs> you know verbally harass someone mm. on the street or whatever mm. if they'd been in MMA they'd know how close they are to getting knocked out like as in oh, sure. the opportunity like whereas if you've never been in a physical confrontation and you've just watched movies mm. you don't think that yeah you know, I think I think yeah like we come back to that whole society chat and the culture that we live in people don't they have a kind of an idea of, of how it is but like you just said when you when you train or, or when you understand what someone can actually do to you yep. then the way that you approach them and, and, and talk to them is different yeah. because you understand you know hey how dangerous this is when mm. I started training I went wow I'm not that tough and I can't just say what I want <laughs> because I've realized some the other event. side of the yep. coin you know and yeah I think that's a societal thing you yeah know? People just watch movies and they think they can say what they want. But, you know, in Australia, maybe you can get away with it a little bit, but in other countries, you can't. Oh, mate. <laughs> so, back to yourself. What was the, you know, did you grow What sports did you grow up doing? I, sure. I, I, played, um, I played rugby growing up primarily. I played union a lot of basketball as well. I played union. Yep. Um, just because my older brothers played yep. that. Um, yeah, and that's what we played. I played uh, extent. I like, played a lot of rugby growing up, and I really did like it. Mm. Um, both, both codes. I played rugby league as well. And um, yeah, I just think it's a great sport. Like yep. I really like the physical, um, competitive side of rugby. You know, everyone loves getting the ball and running at someone you know, yeah, when yeah, you're young yeah. or tackling someone. So yeah, for me that was that was great. And I, I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was that I liked about rugby. It wasn't so much necessarily the game or the rules or whatever it was. It was, it was, a just, it was just the physical contest yeah. and the and the competitive nature. It's just like you're with fourteen other guys or thirteen other guys or whatever it is, just tackling people and getting smashed like, I mean as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a young boy that's that's fun you know so growing up I, w- I, I knew I loved the, the competition of it but mm-hmm. I hadn't found what was for me and the, and when the day I found uh, Muay Thai and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was like ah oh, this is it oh really because so I was knew. always athletic as such but yep. I wasn't a, I wasn't necessarily a rugby player yep. you know, I wasn't going to be the best rugby player yeah, okay. but yeah. I liked to compete and I had to find something that I loved you know and, so how did that all come about your first Muay Thai session or just Jiu Jitsu <laughs> I was actually at school yeah so I was in high school at the time and um, you know Google was around don't be fooled I'm not that old <laughs> so um, yeah I'd, I'd done my research and I had watched the UFC uh, volumes knockouts 1, 2 and 3 oh really <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like we were just talking about the old school UFC knockout like, volumes knockout volumes I was like man look at this people get knocked out I've got to do this so I, I saw I was kind of inspired by watching the UFC originally so yep. I was that second generation of MMA guys who came about and didn't learn just individual arts or come from one art, you know, like the first UFC fighters. Mm. I was the one who initially started jiu-jitsu and, and Muay Thai with the, the mind of fighting okay. MMA one day. Yep. So anyway, I, I found a gym, I Google online, found a gym, it was a VT1 gym. It's the gym that I'm still at today. And so, oh wow, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So the journey has been a long one for me and my coaches who actually were pretty young guys when they started the gym as well. Yep. So I found this gym, uh, you know, Rang them up, you know. I'm just just a young a young boy. I was like, oh, man, I want to come Hello, down. Hello, uh, yeah, 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 yeah fight. Testy popping. <laughs> I want to come down and uh, you know, I want to, you know, my brother t- showed me some boxing because my brother had had boxed. <laughs> my before. brother showed my brother boxing. showed me some boxing, <laughs> and I had all these I had all these wonky moves that you know that, that actually weren't boxing moves. So um, yeah, we walked up to the gym. It was just a scout hall. Yeah, yeah, oh really like PCYC or whatever like. not even just like a girl scout hall oh, yeah you know, one of those girl scout hall <laughs> yep. and, the, and the boys so I, I met these the two brothers uh, Dylan and Liam Reznikov who, who still own VT1 gym in uh, in Chatswood and uh, this was originally they were just renting out a girl scout hall so I rocked up and everyone put down the mats the jigsaw <laughs> mats put down the mats yeah and there's about 10 dudes training there and they're like you know my coach at the time had, had been training for 10 years judo and yep. jiu-jitsu and, and his brother was a kickboxer so that's where I first started learning with them. And, you know, the Girl Scout would end, end you know, the, whatever they do, Cubs or whatever it is, and then we'd come and put the mats down and we'd train. Mm. And eventually there was 10 people, there was 20 people, there was 30 people, there's 100 people. Now there's 800 or 900 people at the gym. What? And, and they have a four-level place in Chatswood. Like, wow. This, this, is, a, this is the journey of, of martial arts in Australia, mixed martial arts, is 
you could do a timeline yeah. in that gym. We started in the scout forward. hall. Yeah. Yep. yeah, basically. Started in the scout hall. You know, we polished our skills and honed them and, and learnt off people and travelled overseas yep. everywhere. And now the gym's, you know, huge. And, Far, uh, yeah. 800 I've been with people. the same boys ever since the start. You know, I've added in a couple of coaches. Yep. My boxing coach, Adam Higgins, and, and uh, wrestling coach, Gary Jones, is American because I've needed to. But I've stuck with the same guys that, that you know, that taught me the lessons when I was young. Mm. And, and uh, I think, you you know, you, you get a certain amount of um, parenting, you know, you know, from your mum and dad that, that is positive, but you need these other figures in your life that are, that are motivators and, and want to put you in the direction where you want to go. Yeah. And, and for me, uh, Liam, who's my head coach, Liam Reznikov, was that guy. You know, there was... It was he was kind of harnessed and and then and, and kind of pushed me in the right direction. You know, he knew I wanted to be a mixed martial artist, and he yep. took care of me when we were young. We were sparring with head guards, and we we're doing the right things. And he'd get me to work with good trainers and whatever whatever need be. Yeah. So you got to stick with people. I believe that that you know have the right uh, right attitude, and they're looking out for you. So for me, that's what I've done. I've stuck with the people who've, who've got me there in the first place and, and got a bit of loyalty. Man, eight hundred people. Yeah, that's fucking crazy like a mm. gym a gym in itself is hard to run to, oh, yeah, to grow to 800 people from 10 is oh, insane just crazy like from going from, going from a girl's out hall to <laughs> to literally owning owning the building and, and uh you met, like, a gym's one of the things it's like a cafe and a, you know a gym people just open them thinking that they're going to do well yeah, they yeah. Like to train or they are a trainer but yep. you know it's a business and it's like anything it's it's not easy to run it's one thing being a good coach it's another thing being a good business guy. oh man that's yeah. crazy so when was the time when you were like I want to have my first fight um, I think it was 19 when I had my first mixed martial arts fight but before that you you went about what 6-0 and for your boxing yeah and yeah so 10 I've, and done, I've, done some, I've done some amateur fights and when I really wanted to like then step up into the mixed martial arts yep we um, I think it was about 20 19, 20 so yeah I've been training for 3, 4, 5 years whatever it was at the time and uh, we would got a fight where was it Penrith so out west here it was on a show promoted by Jamie Tahuna and Tama his brother um, it was called Elite Fight Night in Penrith so all I remember is uh, you know, got an opponent and I, I, this was probably the most nervous I've been you know, I had to make weight and I was still fighting at welterweight so I'd had to do a weight cut for the first time and we didn't know what we were doing back then yeah, like, yeah. This, like, the science that's behind it? the sport now and weight cutting is, is out of control I know, I know how, to, how much I can lose this day out yep. that day whatever else so we had to figure it out on the fly a little bit. Like when you had a box a bit, when you had a wrestle a bit. A bit yep. But it was a, it was my first um, MMA fight, uh, so I'm just real nervous. So I get to the weigh-ins and I've had a terrible weight cut. You know, there's times where I jumped on the scales an hour before and I'm like, oh shit, I'm two kilos over. Oh I'm my lose two god! Kilos. We get we get in a, a 1.3 liter Starlet. This little this little turd box car. We put the heating on. Oh. I, I get I've got garbage bags strapped to my legs. I'm in there with with a jumper, a hoodie, track pants, shirts. I'm running around the car park. I get back in this car to try to stay warm and stay sweating. And it's just what? This is like this is the worst way to do it. Yep. Anyway, we got we finally made the way in and um, you know made it to the venue the next day. And and uh, you know all I remember is this first fight entrance song. What would you pick? Uh, Eminem uh, till I collapse. Okay, there you go. you've thought of this. Okay, so I had Kenny Loggins' Highway to the Danger Zone. <laughs> but I, I don't know why. I've just got an eccentric taste in music or odd taste in music. But um, yeah, I wanted to come out to Danger Zone. I had these skins just came out at the time. I, had, oh, I just no. had a black, pair, a black pair of skins and a, and a mohawk. You oh, know, no. If, if everyone's watching colored? this. Yeah, and my, no, not coloured, but I've had a coloured <laughs> one before. But I had a bloody, like a Chuck Liddell mohawk. Oh, God. Yeah, so it came out, uh, but backstage warmed me up. as like my mouth was dry. Like, I was, you know, I felt weak and... But yeah, this lethargic just, this and nervous. Yeah, lethargic. Yep. This is just adrenaline stuff. Yeah. We came out to the, the highway to the danger zone, made my way into the ring and, and it was like a blur. You know, I've got, I look at the photos now and it's just, it, yeah, it's crazy. But basically the fight ended in a few minutes. So I punched the guy and dropped him to the ground, took his back, took my hooks in, choked him out with a rear naked choke. Yep. Um, basically MMA 101. But that was probably the best experience, the single experience in my life. Oh, really? As far as emotions, you know. After that fight, it was just like a release of emotions. That, so know, nervous. The, fight, the hand got raised, and I was just like, I literally I started crying right there. As soon as my hand was, I started crying. I was just like, ah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, release of yeah, this. Yeah, this yeah. Uh, you had a dam full of just emotion that would have just yeah, opened. That, that was it, man. So that was the first you know real fight that really um, 
yeah, I can say the first MMA fight that I had, there was just, yeah, awesome experience. Was he another amateur as well? Yeah. No, no, no. That was the first pro one. That was that, no amateur. There was no amateur MMA. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's okay. so both. Boxing, kickboxing. Yep. There's, so now the, so now kids or MMA, uh, you know, young dudes who yep. do an MMA have an amateur organization that they can wear shin guards, head guards, and do modified rules, you know, elbows and knees. Um, we didn't have that. Huh. We, we just had you straight, straight, to the, straight to the pros in saying that there's different classes of amateur so A class they can do uh, everything but elbows I think mm. so it's basically MMA yeah pro which is like yeah. how often does so an elbow land you know, what's that well like even how often does an elbow land in low low level yeah well, elbows are a pretty specialised technique I yeah. believe you know, unless you're a Muay Thai guy you're not going to bother with them on the ground yeah. maybe but yeah it's and you're, you can't do the 12 to 6 is it can't do the twelve to six. You can't do the squirrel grip, the oil check. <laughs> the do, oil check. Yeah, no, you can't do twelve to six elbows, which means you can't bring your fist obviously, you know, above your head and then in, in a downward motion on the back of the head from a standing position. You can do it if you're lying on your back in like a closed guard position. Yeah. But you know, if I'm on my back and I've got the guy in my guard, I can I can do an elbow like that on the top yep. of their head. Okay. That's totally that's totally legal. Legal. Okay. Mm. Um. So I guess after you had that first fight, yeah. you you've, you've tasted it and you love it. Yeah, tasted it, and I had I strung three fights together pretty quick. Um. So second fight, you know, I fought a actually a guy from Wollongong. Um, same kind of thing took him down one on a decision and the third fight I actually had was against Robert Whittaker oh really so I'm taking the fight so this is when I started, started getting a bit ahead of myself yeah. well, we're actually we were both young we were both very young we were both teenagers um, yeah, and I was I was supremely confident in the lead up to that fight and I took it on two weeks notice you know they rang me up and they said hey do you want to fight the big promotion back then was cage fighting championships this is 2009 or 8 yep this is the biggest promotion in Australia it was promoted by Luke Pizzuti and they had shows in you know, Luna Park and, and other big bigger yep. you know, venues in Australia so they said hey we've got, to, we've got to fight for you in two weeks do you want to take it I said sure <laughs> I don't know who the guy is Robert Whittaker alright so I took the fight and in saying that we were both very in the early beginnings of our career yep. took the fight in two weeks you know, I've been pumping weights you know, thought I was in good shape but anyway fir- first round uh, we touched, we touched hands, and uh, yeah, I think in the first round I took him down about five times. Yep. Took his back, nearly had a rear naked choke. Because his wrestling used to be, yeah, um, his weakest point. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. So like my wrestling, my jutsu was was, I think, quite a higher standard than him at the time. Yeah, and I'd suplexed him, taken him down like six, you know, half a dozen times, and then round two started. And I remember between round one and two, I looked at my my coach Liam and I was like, ah, I'm done. I'm done. What you said? Like, that? No, it was in like I'm done. Like I'm gas. Like I'm fucking. I'm like I'm gas. I'm gas. He's like Richie. Richie, just calm down. Calm down. And this is the this is the fight that I had that stupid mohawk. Oh. And, it was, oh yeah, and it was died. It was oh, died. No. Should have knocked the pain off it because that was the last time I had hair. But, um, yeah, I think I think after I showed that mohawk, the hair just disappeared. Yeah, I think your hair was so offended oh, by the man. mohawk it, it didn't so, come my, back. Yeah. So anyway, came out round two. Went for about two and a half minutes. I took him down again a couple of times. I was on top. And he reversed me, and he reversed me within five seconds. He reversed me, put a choke on, and I put my hands out and got choked like a moron. <laughs> so I lost the fight. You know, so you just like you yeah, just weren't thinking. You just was like, yeah. The so lesson was you can win ninety percent of the fight, ninety five percent of the fight. You switch off for ten second. seconds in MMA. That's the beauty of the sport. You lose. Yeah. You know, you have to stay very focused emotionally, you know, physically, whatever it is. You have to be focused on what you're doing. And mm. my gas started to go. Exactly. And I started to be tired, but then I started to focus on, I'm tired, I'm tired, yep. I'm tired. Not, okay, I'm tired, cool. Take a couple of breaths, move around, reset, yep. and back on the task, which is winning the fight. Mm. Every moment I think about how tired I am or what Robert Whittaker's doing or my opponent is the second that I'm not thinking about myself. Yep. And ultimately, that was a, that was probably the best lesson that I ever learned in mixed martial arts was that loss. Oh, okay, yeah. And then I took two years off before my next fight. <laughs> And learn yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, but I went back to training. I, I yep. did a stint overseas in university in America. Got drunk, chased a lot of birds around. <laughs> they love Aussie guys over yeah, there. Mate. <laughs> they love the accent. Yeah. Just ham it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. would have been ham it up. Hi, yeah, yeah, mate. I was in, I was in, uh, in Georgia over there at university. So, but back to the fight. That was the best experience I learned. That loss there basically set the precedent for for the next, you know, till now. My yep. training is just that. That was the fight that kept me in the game, not the oh, one okay. knocking out of it. Yep. So yeah, it's it's you know I think you you have good days, you have bad days, but you learn the most from not your mistakes, but sometimes the the bad experiences. Yeah. I'm not going to use the word bad. I don't, I don't like to use it, but yeah. you have experiences that are unwanted. Yeah. But you learn the most from them. Tough, you know? tough experiences. Tough experiences, yeah. you know, and and they're the ones that you know make you 
realize if you really want that, want something or you don't want it. Mm. And, uh, and and in the end, the person that I lost to, Robert Whitaker, back then we were both teenagers. He's now ranked number five in the UFC in the middleweight That's division, crazy. and I'm in the welterweight division. So yep. it's 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 a bit of a trip, you know, when you yeah. see guys that you grow up with, and some people drop out, some people stay in. Mm. There's always your mate that could have made it, but quit because he had girl problems or yeah, this yeah, and that. Yeah. And you take a look around at the people that are still left, right? And you say, oh, that my mate there, he was actually better than me, but mm. you know, he wanted to leave because of his girl, or he had to work, or he had an apprenticeship, yeah. or whatever. And then at the end of the day, you're left there because I think you didn't make the excuses and you, mm. and, and you, and you just stuck to your guns. Mm. And you're not, not necessarily, I think, the best or the most athletic or whatever it is, but you're the one that stuck there, mm. worked hard, yep. and obviously you've got to have some skill to start with. Mm, yeah. But yeah. that's the point I'm getting at. Yeah. Man. I was just there long enough that they go, oh, well, we'll give this guy. We'll give this guy a go. You got any for uh, him? Yeah. 20 <laughs> losses, one win. Yeah, we'll give him a go. Um, Oh, that's awesome, bro. So, when your first UFC fight then? Yeah, so I was, I was on the Ultimate Fighter in uh, North America, in Canada. So, yep. that, that was a bit of an experience. And, and we did, I've done the tryouts here in the, in the first season. They had an Ultimate Fighter Australia versus England. Mm. And I was a reserve for that. And that was the series that Rob Whitaker was on. He did one of the biggest knockouts I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Brad Scott. Literally no, punched his Scott. head off yeah, his I know, shoulders. I know who you're talking about, yeah. Massive right hand. Massive right hand. Oh, yeah. I think, like... And the guy was good as well. Yeah, and he just guy. and no one and p- people were backing him. Like they, the show kind of made out that he was going to win. And then Whitaker just over the top. Oh man, he's got exceptional timing, which you, you can't teach. Yeah, that. You know, you're it's born natural. With that. Yeah, natural. And he's got power and speed for mm. a big boy. So yeah, I got the opportunity on the show. If, you, if you're not familiar with it, it's just basically where they get a bunch of dudes, yep. chuck them in the house, point. record you nonstop, six different cameras. Um, you go to the gym twice a day for like two hour sessions get murdered and basically there's a fight every three days two weight divisions in my house welterweight middleweight fight every three days bing 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 for the duration of the filming eight weeks so as in as in one fight every three days yeah so they'd have so we'd get to the house three days later they had a welterweight fight someone won or lost three days after that they had a middleweight three days after that welterweight okay. and it went for like eight weeks <laughs> till everyone had fought each other yeah and eventually there was only going to be people left for the finals Made it to the semis, so won, won my first one, made it to the semis, lost that one, but got the opportunity to fight in the finale. Yeah. So I fought in the finale, and um, that was my first, I guess, I had UFC. two fights in the house, which everyone did, yeah. I lost my second one. Uh, so not, not everyone did, sorry. It's a knockout competition, so I made it to the, the second round, yeah. and the third round was the final, so semis. And um, had the opportunity to then come on the finale and, and go to Quebec and Canada and fight on the finale, and uh, won that fight. So that kind of just... Got me off on the on the on the right. So what foot. was that? What was that experience like? You know, walking out to your first real UFC fight. It's like, surreal, you know, and um, you know, it's a bit of a step up, obviously, from the first one down at Penrith Leagues Club. <laughs> where you might get you might be ducking bottles on the way out <laughs> <laughs> and barbed wire. Especially at Penrith. Nah, but, but yeah, it was a bit of a trip, and um, you know, I just kind of took it all in and, and enjoyed it. And what for me, like when I do walk out, especially that first fight, I don't try and. You know, there's people who look to the crowd and they high five people and they're stoked. And yeah, you know, I'm stoked to be there, but I'm just yep. when I walk down, I try to just be as calm as I can. Mm. Just walk to the cage, I get in there, and then I start because once you start, you touch hands, it's it's autopilot. Yeah, dude's trying to knock your head off, yep. and the rest is history. But yeah, it was a great fight for me, and it was just an awesome experience. Like, Got any funny memories from the house? <laughs> <laughs> there's a few memories from the house. I definitely met some good characters. Um, you know what? I think they they kind of put us in a good light. You know what I mean? Oh, really? <laughs> they, you know, they like they like to portray, and I think it's good for the UFC that yep. they, they have a clean cut image, and, and no one's really <laughs> stuffed around too much. But there's some. Oh man, okay. So I got a, I got a good memory. There's a guy on <laughs> there's a guy in the show, uh, a New Zealand kid, uh, Tyler Manoroa. I don't know if yep. you remember him. He was on the he was on the series, and he was 18 at the time. Yep. on the Ultimate Fighter and just an absolute legend of a kid yep. and like he was a God's gift right to to mix martial arts he was like 18 and 0 from Queensland had every belt up there had the world ahead of him yep. in mixed martial arts no joke the world ahead of him and he'd pick up a soccer ball in the house he'd be juggling this thing behind his back over his head he was just like that little brother but this guy could beat the shit out of him yeah, yeah. he was a middleweight heaps of power heaps of skill 
he's in the house, um, you know, and there's a bloke on there who's still in the UFC who's actually three and one, Nordin Taleb. Great fighter. Taleb, yeah, yeah. yeah Taleb. He yeah. just knocked out Eric Silva. Yeah. Super ripped guy. And and everyone on the all of the Canadians on the team are like, this guy's the baddest guy. He's from Trice, from George St. Pierre's gym. He's the baddest guy. You should see him move. You should see him spy. He knocks dudes out. He's crazy. They're just talking him up and everyone's like, Ooh, this guy's pretty staunch. Like he didn't talk to anybody. Just arrogant. Arrogant at first, but like you said before, we were talking about it. When you get to know him, you're like, ah, just I misunderstood him. Uh, okay. That okay. was his demeanor, was like just, what I'm gonna like? come into the house, right? There's eight Canadians, eight Australians. Yep. He came in with the uh, under the impression like, fuck these guys. I'm yeah, gonna, okay. I'm going to act staunch. I'm going to scare them. They know I'm tough, and I'm just gonna, not going to talk to these it's guys. A competition. We're, we're all the Aussies are in there. We're like, hey, guys, nice yeah. to meet yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you guys from? Like, oh, no game at all. No <laughs> game at all. We could, we could learn something from those guys. They could, they knew how to game it a bit. So talking this guy up, he's the toughest guy in the world. And Tyler's this, this kid from Queensland who's, yeah, go drinking with my mates. Like, he's, he's just laid back, funny yep. kid, like, lo- loose guy, loose guy, <laughs> but, you, but you love him. And um, they were supremely confident when he got matched up against him. That was the thing. So, so, <laughs> so Pat Cote's a coach and, and Colin Oak, two UFC fighters, one Canadian coach, one Australian coach, just to set the, you know, the scene for you. They do these call-outs where you're in the gym and they bring both teams, you're wearing all your singlets, you know, Canadian team, Australian team standing in front. Coaches come up and they go, okay, we're going to have our first middleweight fight. And then they call up, um, <laughs> that's it, they call up They call up the two fights, sorry, the first welterweight fight. Yep. And then someone was like, oh, who's going to fight Nordine? <laughs> and uh, and Tyler just stands there and goes, I'll fucking fight him. <laughs> and, 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 and that's when it was like, this guy who's a staunch guy was like yeah you want to fight and they got out in front in front of each other and he goes yeah I'll fucking fight you just <laughs> no fear in this so kid. Aussie yeah fucking fight no, you, mate. Just like, yeah man I'll fucking fight he just gets in his face no fear at all like, yep. we were just like God, <laughs> and um, anyway so they, they got paired up of course the next week they brought up Nordine the guy and he, they said who do you want to fight and Nordine and he's, he's this French uh, he's Algerian French Algerian yep. Canadian guy he's a gun yeah he's a gun he's a gun he's a good, and he's a good bloke Anyway, he gets up, and at this stage, he's a staunch douchebag yep. because we didn't know him. Yep. And he gets up, and, and, they, and they go, okay, Nordin Taleb, you're the first middleweight. You know, Who do you want to fight? And he goes, I want you, Taylor. <laughs> and, he, and he points at him, and, and Tyler's like, that's it. So they get up, they, they, they square up on each other, and us Aussies are like, we've sparred with this Tyler, this kid, yep. this prodigy, and we're like, he's got it. These guys, they just think, they've seen him in the house. He's just eating fucking cheesels. He's eating Doritos yeah, and know, cheese yep. all over the top. <laughs> frying up stuff in, in oil in a pan like no <laughs> diet nothing like doesn't know a thing about nutrition and here's this other guy like cutting perfect. up his cutting everything's perfect he's looks like his body's chiseled out of granite <laughs> so um he gets up anyway and, and obviously if you watch the show you've seen the fight uh tyler comes in and just literally just basically picks him apart just bashes him does this we did a spinning elbow and training two days before and he just tries it for the first time and lands it on his head you know what? so it was just amazing to see and like after that he was just so g'd up he jumped out of the cage and actually did the uh the haka because <laughs> we were him up to do it but it was just it was just good to see like um and and he's also one of the one of the tragedies of the show as well because um, you know, after that, we were like, you know, Tyler's this young kid, so much gun, talent, yeah. yeah, gun, absolute freak. He's got a big future in the UFC, and and then you know, something came up on social media. We were talking about social media before, and he posted something three years ago that got brought up, and then the UFC wouldn't give him a fight. What? Since what is- then, he hasn't fought. This is three years since the show. He hasn't fought. He hasn't done anything MMA. Just gone out partying, drinking. Yeah. That's it. Just slip back into that. What did he post? Oh, he posted some some racial thing. Like it, 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 so he's an Islander, and he had something on it, like a like a small little black kid. Something I, I forget the post. But if but he's an like, Islander, like yeah, he it wasn't. Even, it was one of those memes that was going around. It wasn't like he was maliciously doing anything. And one of the guys from the Ultimate Fighter actually reposted and brought it up so scroll through his social media and brought this post up and, and and the UFC then didn't offer him a fight in the finale subsequently you know he'd gone back up to Queensland he was 18 at the time best fighter I've ever seen and now what is he doing not fighting nothing just heaps of weight but he's, he's an islander like he's a, he's a Maldi so like I he mean, considered himself black anyway. You know, that's that what was, I'm that saying. That's the whole point. He that's what I'm saying. Like, black it, and, it's a very different thing if yeah. it was a white person doing You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it I doesn't, think people get carried away with PC, like political yeah. correctness and, and all this. Especially coming from him. Like, yeah, they, all this bullshit, man. Their land was invaded as well. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. So, yeah, you're telling me. But like, <laughs> So, he was he was one of the great triumphs of the show and one of the real tragedies in the end. Man, because sucks, the man. guy with the most talent 
and uh, a really sweet kid, you know, who hit the ground running when he was in the house with us, yep. didn't get the opportunity to find the UFC, and now he's doing nothing. Far out, um, that sucks. And if, he ever, if I ever meet him again, I'll shake his hand. <laughs> he's a legend. He's a legend. Well, um, well, he had that moment, though. He can always live that moment. Oh, uh, yeah, he had that moment. Because <laughs> Taleb is an absolute gun. Yeah, like, he's t- making a fucking run for the... Yeah, he's a gun, man. Fuck. He's a gun. That's crazy. That's crazy. Okay, so back to yourself. So, yeah, um, your first fight. Do you have any memories from your first fight, you know, stepping in there? And, and was there anything that you remember, like, looking over and seeing or anything? Or is it... Yeah, definitely. It's. I think the first moment when you actually get hit in a fight or you get hit in the first 10 seconds or 30 seconds, you get hit by a hard shot, you're like, ooh. It, it takes sometimes for me and, and it was definitely, I was kind of in there and it was it was like a video game, like I wasn't quite there yep. until I got hit with a big uh, a big kick and I was like, slap! And I went, <laughs> oh, oh. No. Like, you know, I felt that one, I was yep. like, oh shit, we're here to fight. Like, yeah, yeah. Yep. So for me then it was just kind of autopilot and it was um, just trying to get the job done. I've never been one of those fighters that's truly been in there and been like, I love punching people in the face I, yep. I just love the the competition and, and feeling out of control but in control I guess mm. that, that's what I appreciate in a hectic environment but yeah it's, to... it, it's, it's a chaotic environment yeah. where you've got to find some sort of I don't know focus and uh, what's been the toughest times in your career has there been any you know tough times with injury yeah. or anything like that oh for sure um, toughest time was probably coming back from the Joe Ban fight yeah um, you know Joe Ban for, for people that listen if you look him up he's, he's a top welterweight kind got of a contender. hectic body Hectic rig. He's a male model. It's honestly he's basically offensive. everything I am. Yeah. <laughs> he's basically <laughs> everything I'm. It's not. offensive. Great head of hair. Yep. Good looks. Um, Tanned, yeah, yeah, ripped. Tan. Damn. Talented as fuck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck that guy. So anyway, um, he's an asshole. Yeah, basically. So I fought him in LA. Um, you know, and it was the fittest I've ever been. The mm. fittest. The best. Walk us through. I guess the fight even. Yeah. Or? Okay. So you know, rocked up in LA. Busy week. A lot of media stuff. And you know, you always feel like a bit of fish out of water when you're not a big name and it's his second UFC, uh, third UFC fight. Sorry. Mm. And um, you know, you're in his hometown. I'm fighting in, in the hometown of the guy I'm fighting. Um, as far as the fight goes, we touch hands. I'm moving around and I'm sharp. I'm landing shots. And I'm, I, I, I hit him with a couple of shots that, that kind of rock him. Yeah. And there was this moment where he hit me with a body kick, a left body. He's a south boy. Kicked me in the liver. Oof. And in the liver, it feels like you're going to shit your pants. I was like, <laughs> and I remember my mind went from the task at hand, like we were talking about, from yep. like punching this guy's face, moving around, doing my thing to like internal, like, oh man, that hurt. Yeah. The moment that that happened was like a switch. I, I started, I started going on the back foot a bit, and I was moving around, moving around. Yeah. And. I think I just got a little bit stiff and, and I got turned off and got caught with the biggest elbow I've ever been caught with in my life from really? the side of my temple and I wasn't even looking. Because you just focused on your in here. Yeah, I think I think I was just a bit caught up in the adrenaline. It yep. was the first, you know, two and a half minutes where you've got that real adrenaline dump and your fine motor skills haven't quite came to. Yep. You're still a little bit stiff and, and you're very fast but you're stiff. And um, yeah, I just got caught. I just mm. got caught with a, a massive elbow and... and um, you know, I did something that I wouldn't usually do in training, you know? Yeah. And I did it in the fight, and I got caught for it, you know? And when you're fighting at the UFC, you can't do things like that and make mistakes because people will capitalize on them, and yep. they'll hurt you. If it was a lower-level competition I made that mistake, yeah, I probably could have got away with it. Yeah, you... But you, a guy yeah. like Alan Joban, who's a, who's a killer, yep. you know, he made me pay for it. And I didn't get fully, um, you know, unconscious, but, you know, that was the end of the fight. And... Um, you know, then you're in LA, you're in a foreign place, you know, you've just been knocked out. Yeah, so the first fight my mum came to watch. Oh, no. <laughs> walk, walk up walk up to the crowd, just make sure, you know, tell them I'm all right, I'm not dead. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, look, it, again, I don't take the the bad times as, uh, you know, yeah. get me down. Tough I'm, I'm just not. I'm just not one of those kind of guys, you know, so. Yeah. It was shitty, yeah, I lost. Yeah. You know, probably lost some of my memory as well. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I take what I can from it and it was a learning experience and then to come on to the next fight, I made sure I take a little bit of time in between that one and the next one. I fought in Melbourne in front of 57,000 people yep. and won. So, what Was that on the Mark Hunt thing card? Yeah, or? it was on the Ronda Rousey Ronda Rousey card. card. Yeah. Wow. So, 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 so to back up from a loss and not fight for seven months yep. and then fight in, um, in Australia, first time I fought with the promotion of the UFC here in front of 57,000 people being part of that show Win my fight, then get to watch, get to watch uh, Holly Holm, who I had money on, beat Ronda Rousey. Really? Yeah. You knew she had the striking. Oh, Count man. striking. Ten to one. Fucking hell. Any we, tips? We, ask me. No, don't. I'm actually, I'm actually <laughs> the worst of the worst. Walk us through that fight then. Who'd you fight? Um, I fought that one. I fought Stephen Kennedy. Um, yep. Grappler. Uh, you know what? 
an annoying fight for me because Stephen Kennedy, he's one of those guys, he's fine when he's doing the fighting, but as soon as he starts getting hurt, he'll be on the back foot and he'll do anything he can to survive. So in the first three minutes of the fight, I nearly put him down, yep. uh, rocked him with some big shots, nearly dropped him, but he, he'd do anything to survive. Like he'd jump on his back, he'd grab my leg, he'd... Oh, so he's just like trying to get through the fight now. He was literally just—he literally just limped his way through the fight in the first three minutes. I think I leg kicked him five times. It was UFC 193. So I think in the first. Yeah, so walk us through the whole fight. Yeah. Like, so literally, yeah, yeah. my game plan was this, right? I watched Stephen Kennedy fight. I knew that he's very, very heavy on his front foot. Yep. Okay, and he has a tendency to to move one direction when he circles backwards and out. So I knew. Okay. I just um. Sorry, this yep. is footy fan. So just for people that yep. don't understand, when when you're circling one direction, mm. you if you're circling the wrong way, you're circling into someone's power punch, which yeah, is negative. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, some fighters like to circle into someone's power hand if you're an orthodox scene t- towards my right hand and yep. other fighters will circle away from it. So I, I just watched these tapes and I knew that Stephen Kennedy, well, if I push forward, he'll circle to my left. Yep. Okay? So I've got various attacks that I can use from there depending on which way he goes. That's such a uh, yeah. a good thing to know. You can control the fight. Yeah, so well, you know what punch he's going to throw more than likely. Like, say, eight, you know, seven times out of ten, he'll throw this overhand right. Yep. You know? The other three times, he throws a up kick. Okay. You know, I've watched all these tapes. I know what he throws percentage-wise yep. and how often he throws them. And if I put him in this direction, he'll likely do this. Mm. So I'm going to do this a hundredth of a second before he does it and catch him. Mm. So what I saw with Stephen Kennedy was he's heavy on his front foot first thing I, I watched him fight I saw someone kick him in the leg and he didn't check kicks Ooh. check kick means when someone goes to kick you in the leg you lift your leg up they hit your shin bone so it not, hurts the yep. person kicking more than it hurts you Stephen Kennedy didn't check kicks so I came out and I was like fuck this I'm going to come out with Stephen Kennedy I'm going to put some hands up in his face and I'm going to kick the shit out of the leg <laughs> just chop because he doesn't check <laughs> kicks and I kicked him about five times in the first <laughs> minute and a half or two minutes in the black. leg and his leg was black, black. his leg was black black in between rounds it was red and black and blue yep <clears throat> and um, I think that was the, the the moment where I was like he's lost the fight because he he'd been kicked in the leg so many times that he was just slow on his front foot mm. moving on to the next few minutes so, so we're still in round one here I caught him with a big right hand. I sent him wobbly. Like, he, he smiled. So I hit him with a big right hand, and this big shit-eating grin came <laughs> up on his face. He was like, but no, but literally, he was staggering in the cage. He was staggering in the cage, and I was like, that's it. I, I, I charged in, and I started landing a few combinations, and I rocked him, wobbled him. Mm. And again, the experience on my behalf came in where I was head hunting. I was just going for his head, trying to go for that knockout. Uh, okay. And I was getting a bit overzealous. Whereas, like, maybe yeah, now, yeah. You I should have maybe taken just, a step back, yeah. thrown a knee, yep. whatever, and I could have finished him. So again... Uh, he stayed in the contest and, and basically he just limped his way through the next two rounds and jumped on his back and fell to the ground and, and you know yeah. he's a jiu-jitsu guy so I didn't really want to jump into his guard and start playing jiu-jitsu yeah. with him I wanted him to stand up and get yep. knocked out yep. he didn't want to do that I mean I understand why he didn't yeah. but I mean on the day it, it makes me look like a dickhead when he's jumping on his back and, and people in the crowd are going get up and fight you know they weren't yelling at me but I could hear people in the crowd there's yeah. 57,000 people it was quiet enough that people were like Get off your back, Kennedy! Wow, so, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it is weird, and and but for, you know, I needed that win, okay. And the UFC is very cutthroat. We've talked about this. The UFC is yep. cutthroat, you know, and you need a win. And was I going to jump in his garden and just start hammer fisting the crap out of him and yeah. hope that I'd win? And, and playing and fucking the crowd Russian roulette and play, and play to the crowd. Yeah. No, I'm playing Russian roulette with yeah. my career. Yeah, with yeah. my with my you know livelihood, with everything. Yeah, yeah. With my fuel on my car. Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> so basically, I I needed to win that win. Uh, win that win win that fight and then uh, you know prolong the contract to do what I you know what I want to do is and improve in the next fight so you know when you've got a few up your sleeve you can afford to take a few calculated risks but at that moment I just wanted to get the win yeah and so, oh, okay, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, so you won what? It was awesome. You know? 20, did you win 29 27 or 20? Oh, man, it was 30 27. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, it was, no. it was so just complete dominance. It was dominance. a big UD, like, he basically, he should have just quit. So, did the, why didn't the ref stand him up? Like, what? Oh, they stood him up a few times. Yeah, yeah okay. they, stood, they ended up standing him up a few times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, it wasn't a bad fight. It was definitely a, a one sided fight. But, yeah. You know, some guys are just gamers. You know, Stephen, Stephen Kennedy had had. Over thirty fights, so yep. he, he, you know it's not his first rodeo. He knows how to survive a fight. He knows, he, you know, he knows what to do. Mm. Yeah. Um, got any funny memories over your career? Maybe sparring or what, just with the boys mucking around at the gym or anything like that. Not off the top of my head, but I mean, I've got plenty. I've seen plenty of things go down in sparring. You know, yeah, some crazy stuff. Yeah, I mean, look, we've always been one to take care of our training partners, but yep. occasionally, like, there's this 
yeah, occasionally you get guys who just come in, like back in the early days, who'd be like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from this martial art and I want to come train with you guys. Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll come in, train, yep. you know. And then they've got no knee guards on and you go to take a shot and they just throw a knee in your face and you're like, uh, what the fuck? You know, like, what are you doing, mate? Yeah. Like, you got a, I got a fight coming up in two weeks and you've got no knee pads. And you're fucking throwing knees and in your head. And you're throwing knees. So <laughs> in that circumstance, and I've only, like, I'm not that proud of it, but this is one of the moments where it happened to me twice in a row and I said to the guy, what, what are you doing? Yeah. Need me in the head and then he went to elbow me and I just met this guy. So I had to put him on his on his ass. I had to do it. I had to. I had to do it. I had to do it. Nah, I wasn't. I wasn't going to knock him out. I put him. I put him on his ass hard with a big, with a big suplex, and basically over the top of this guy, just dropping these big body shots. Because I'm not that much of a prick that I'm going to knock him out. And I'm not going to punch his face off. And man, go to some gyms and they would. You know. Yeah. Yeah. If you disrespect them, but I just gave him so many body shots, I made him quit. And then I mm. kept going. I said, I'm not, I'm not quitting. So he's there five minutes getting getting body shot. Getting shotted, peppered. Getting Fuck. peppered. But you got to know, like, when you go somewhere, you got to show respect, you know? Yeah, especially yeah. in such a delicate situation like a fight, a, a yeah. uh, fight gym. Yeah. It's just just one yeah. wrong move from someone and shit can just... Yeah, you, you cut someone's face. I mean, I mean I've, I've been cut open plenty of times on the yep. mats, you know, with, with elbows. And especially, you know, Alex Volkanovsky, actually. Really? He said he just spoke to me. He cut me before my last fight. Just here on the eyebrow. That motherfucker. Yeah, that motherfucker. If you're listening, Bill, mate. If you are listening, yeah, Hulk. So he cut me before the last fight, then it happens, you know. Yeah. You always, and that's not from sparring hard. That's just, you know, accidental. Just happens, Accidents yeah. happen. Fuck, I got cut in footy training. Exactly so. right. And yeah. you're coming in there to punch each other in the face. Mm. You know, occasionally people get hurt. Yeah. Um, yeah, but definitely, definitely had some uh, experiences in sparring. But yeah. That was that was one of them, but you know I'll I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Any no, other? No, nothing naked. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. Any other stories from your career that you kind of pinnacles or peaks or anything like that? Other than or, you know, obviously. Yeah, look, I mean, probably if if you want to watch a good fight that I think you know, listeners should watch, check out. I had a fight on. Um, you can probably get on Fight Pass or just even look it up. Yeah. It's um, versus a guy, a Japanese guy called Kichi Kunamoto, and that was in the UFC, and that was my fight in Tokyo, mm. and. Uh, you know, this was my first fight after the Ultimate Fighter. This Japanese guy had had over 40 fights, had multiple titles in Japan, and just, you know, that's a scary feat for coming from Sydney, from humble beginnings in a scout hall of 10 people to now fighting in the UFC yeah. in Saitama Super Arena, which is where they had all the Pride events when Mark Hunt was the K1 heroes. It was this is a, this is a big thing for me. So I'm in there fighting this guy and. You know, this is a fight that they, they bring you over to Japan and they probably want the Japanese guy to win. Yeah, definitely. Picture this, Japan, 30,000 people. You're fighting. No one is talking. Oh, because they're all so respectful. It's yeah, yeah, it's part of the culture. It's dead silent. Yeah. It is dead silent. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, yeah, you could hear a pin drop. For people that aren't aware, Japanese culture is very... They don't they don't cheer and yell and, and all that carry on like, a, like mm. Western audiences. Not at all, yeah. So And they don't like blood. So anyway, <laughs> which whoa, is whoa, I don't think anyone does. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we're in Japan. It's dead silent. I'm fighting their hometown hero, peroxided blonde haired oh, Japanese no. guy. Who's, he was you ten years ago with the yeah, mohawk. He's fake, he's fake tanned up to, <laughs> to the nines. And um, yeah, we just, we just, this is a, this is a good fight if you want to see, um, you know, just throwing just walk down, it, some, yeah, just throwing walk down some punches. So I start the fight off, and, and I like to start quick and yep. um, just hitting him with some big shots and. And drop him straight away with a left hook, right mm. hand, drop him on the canvas. And he's a very good jiu-jitsu guy. So again, I don't want to jump to the ground. With yeah, him. getting his guard. So boom, he goes for a leg lock straight away. He's a bit wobbling on his yeah. on his ass. And I get back to my feet, move around, move around. Okay. A minute later goes by. I know he goes for a double leg, which is a, like a rugby tackle. Yeah. And he always puts his head on the one side, which is on my Hello. left my left hip, right? Yeah. So he always puts his head there. So I, I practice to throw my left jab out and my left kick behind it. So he's going to cop the knee if he level changes yep. for the for the tackle. So this happens. It's like I'd visualized it. I throw the left jab, boom. I throw the kick and he catches the knee. Oh. Drop, drops him on his ass. I come in here for the kill. I'm going in. But this just goes on and on for like three rounds where I'm basically just peppering him with dropping shots. Dropping him in. Yeah, like dropping and peppering with shots. He gets a few chances where he's just hugging on and he's, yep. he's got my back. And it was all fairness to him. He's a good fighter. And then at the end of the fight, um, <laughs> this is the pinnacle. At the end of the fight, they're like, it's a split decision. I was like, split decision? I just beat the shit out of him. There's a split decision. And they put his hand up. He oh, wins. Oh, fuck. He off. wins. And there's, there's basically like, so. How are you feeling in that moment? Were you like, what oh, the f- I was just kind of in a bit of disbelief. Like I was pumped up from the fight. And I was happy. I was like, I fought well. Yeah. You know, like, but it was a split decision loss. <laughs> 
So I walk up backstage and, and, and again, like, there's not much, you know, there's people, a reporter comes over me like, did you think you lost that fight? And I was like, no, did you? And they're like, no. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. I didn't lose the fight. So anyways, it was the number two most controversial decision of the year. Out of, oh, wow. 10 UFC fights a year. It was number, that's really, really fucking yeah, it bad. Yeah, was number two. So it was basically, I won, but I lost. So that goes on my CV as a, a loss. <laughs> lost. So what did you say, did the UFC say to you? Were they like, just nothing? Just cop nothing. it? Nothing. <laughs> just, you got ripped off by a judge who was from Australia anyway. That's the fun what? part. Yes. Yeah, so, so to tell you, I won't mention any names, but you know, there's, there's a certain, I guess there's three judges in, yeah. you know, in any UFC fight. And uh, one of the judges was an Aussie guy and he gave the fight to the Japanese guy. And this same judge <laughs> came up to me after the fight to me and my dad in the hotel lobby. And he's like, Richard, so good to see you. So good to see what? you. What? No joke, no joke. This is what this is it. He comes over and he goes, Spin So good down. to see you, Richard. Oh, what a great fight. Shakes my hand. He's looking at my dad. He goes, Richard, you won that fight. You won that fight, mate. That was excellent. What a great fight. What a great display of martial arts. And then he's talking to my dad for ten minutes. My dad just turns to me and goes, Who was that fuckwit? Like my dad was just like, This guy's a fuckwit. Yeah. Scorecards come out the next day. Who gives the fight to the opponent? He does. What? <laughs> what? what? The fuck? So 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 two judges gave it to him. One gave it to me. One Aussie judge gave the Japanese guy the fight, and I gave him the ass kicking of his life. And the what guy the came up fuck? to me afterwards and told me and my dad, but my won. dad and I, that I'd won. What a cuck, cocksucker! What a cocksucker! Like to have the audacity. Oh yes, the I know. Audacity. I know. Yeah. I'm not even angry about it. I just think it's funny. Like, yeah, like, I, like uh, maybe I was at the time, but I just think that's funny. You walked up to a trained killer. Yeah. And essentially knew that you had done what you'd done. Yeah. And to rub it in even worse, you carried on like your best mates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, you sure, what, how yeah. do you feel after that? Surely you wanted to find him and hurt him. Surely. Oh, man. You know, I, like, I'm just... Yeah. Just like, like, I've seen this person around at events and, and he does local shows or whatever else. And, and you know, um, what can I do, man? I, I live and learn. <sighs> what a you know, fucking grub. I know. <laughs> like, what no, a no joke. Grub. Actually came up to my family and had a big chat with us about how well I fought and I won and unbeknownst to me and, and this is still a joke we have so so when I finish training sessions right, you know you see people they finish fights win or lose they put their hands up yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah because you never know what the judges are thinking in that in that little head of theirs yeah, yeah. you don't know if they, if they were they focusing on me were they focusing on my opponent were they watching our feet yep. were they checking out the chick with the fake tits in the audience yeah, there's, pictures of, there's pictures of yeah. judges doing this like yeah, walking ba- away from fights basically so when you when you finish the fight you put your hands up so after we finish training um, Coach Liam is always like, that's it, 10 laps. You just won the fight. So we've done sparring. We have to run around the gym with our hands up for 10 laps. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm practicing. And he's like, you yell at the judges. Tell them you won. <laughs> and this same judge, I yell his name out every time I say it. And, and he, my coach goes, yell it, blah, 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 that you won the fight. And I yell at him. This, this is a ritual of mine. For the last, for the he's last still in your head, bro. He's still there yeah, living. But, 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 you know, we've, made, we've taken a positive from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And, it and we, we have a bit of fun with it. <laughs> Don't leave it in the judges' hands. Yep. Again, I should have finished the guy. The judge should have gave the fight to me. This should have, yeah. should have, should have this. But and, and for happen. people that don't uh, watch MMA, a split decision means that his decision, if he had chose you, you win the fight. Yeah, correct. Ah, oh, right, bro. That's fucking. That's fucked. Um, I ask all the guests his favorite rapper of all time. I'm not sure if you're a rap, rap guy. Yeah, look, man. I love. I used to love rap. Obviously, you know, you can't go past Biggie Smalls, yep. some of his original stuff. And I really was a big fan of DMX. DMX? Yeah, probably okay, my favorite. He's really favorite falling off now. And, the, yeah, and there was the X, so. Yep. Yep. Favorite animals in the X. What's that? Did you say the favorite no, animal? No, 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 no. DMX, DMX is my favorite rapper. And there was X was the album was my favorite. Oh, album. and there was X. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and favorite movie of all time? Oh, that's a tricky one. I'd say Dumb and Dumb. Dumb and Dumber. No. <laughs> like any of those, any of those old kind of stupid movies yeah. that I remember. So just so, um, so stupid they're funny. Yeah. Did you absolutely. like number two? The- no, I didn't even watch number two, mate. You know why? Because I was like, don't want to ruin. If, if I watch number two, it's going to ruin number one. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you yeah. mean. All right, brother. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Really appreciate it. And, I appreciate uh, it. And good luck in the future. Give a shout out to a few people. Yeah, bro. Whatever you want. Just a shout out to. Uh, the guys down at VT1 Gym yep. um, who've been with me for, uh, since the start if anyone wants to check it out. Also, um, my boxing coach, Adam Higgins mm. and uh, wrestling coach, Gary Jones and Sweet. Uh, all the fans out there if you want to get a hold of me just anytime, it's uh, Rich UFC yep. on Instagram and uh, check out my Facebook page, Richie Walsh MMA mm. and um, you know, I'm pretty good at 
replying to anyone who messages yeah. me. If you've got any questions about weight cutting, you want to get into martial arts, you're an up and comer, or you just got a general question, just just hit it at me and I'll get back to you. Sweet, bro. We'll um in the snippets, we'll scroll across like you're at Absolutely. and all that kind of stuff. So good. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Boom. Boom.